Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our annual State of the Union, which today is going to be hosted at our first ever Quantum Developer Conference, or sometimes we just call it QDC for short. We're all here because we're working on the same goal. We really want to realize useful quantum computing. This conference will give you hands-on experience at our new tools, help you form new collaborations, and I hope it inspires the community to work together, learn, and embark on discovering new algorithms so that we can make quantum computing useful. But why now? My view is quantum computers are now tools for scientific discovery. But what do I mean by this? Last year, we showed that a noisy quantum computer could produce accurate expectation values on 127 qubits using 2,880 gates and be outside the area of brute force classical computation. We declared that we entered a new era, and we called this era the era of utility. In this experiment, imagine you have 10 black boxes. Each one of these determines some outcome z, and there's some parameter theta that represents something that has changed. And what is really cool about this is that every one of them is 20% different. Now, what to me is amazing is one of these is actually on a quantum computer. And this is the blue lines here. So if we go one step further, the rest are simulators. Not brute force ones, because we cannot do brute force ones. They're approximate simulators. We actually don't know which one of these is the correct one. And in fact, even further, some of these simulation methods, they converge based on converging to the experimental results. So from this, what we say is quantum is now a viable tool to look at circuits that are beyond exact brute force methods. I really, really do think this is a big deal, and this is what I mean by it's a scientific tool to explore quantum advantage. But we don't want to be the only ones searching for advantage. We know that you, the users, are the experts in your fields, and you know where to look. So last year, we showed this slide, and it shows the average number of qubits people are using. And you see that in 2023, the average was 13 qubits. There were a few papers that were at the 100 qubit range. And we heard from you all. We heard that it was not easy to run at a large scale. So we made lots of changes. I think you all saw it, like Kiskit 1.0, a lot of enablement learning material to run bigger circuits. We really focused on improved performance, and you're going to hear a lot about that today. And we wanted to get the users running large circuits. So I am extremely happy to see that the average usage of our system now, using the Eagle processor, is 40 qubits, and using the Heron processor is 115 qubits. To me, this is a disruptive change. And now you don't have to believe us that we've entered the era of utility. The community, or you using the machines, are now in this era that we call our utility. And we are seeing a lot of scientific work done with our quantum computers. Quantum computers are making progress in optimization and machine learning problems, and quantum computers are making progress in simulation looking at scientific domains such as material science, condensed matter, and particle physics. So to me, it's clear that quantum computers are useful for science. However, we've still got, not got to the point where a quantum computer can do something cheaper, faster, or more accurate 
than a classical computer. This is the point that we call quantum advantage. I'm hoping that we can achieve this in the next couple of years, and it's not too far away. I think it can just be around the corner if we can really get algorithm discovery happening. As I said before, I strongly feel that to get to quantum advantage, it will not be done by IBM alone. After all, as I said, you're all the experts in your field. Just to look at it slightly different, we also think the future of computing is bigger than quantum alone. It's going to be quantum plus classical. It's going to use both quantum and classical computing to discover these algorithms. Our thesis is that this future of computing is about mapping interesting problems to matrices or tensors and quantum circuits. And this architecture we call quantum-centric supercomputing. Our goal at IBM is to enable fast, accurate quantum circuits which can be used as these subroutines in this future of computing. For these circuits, there's in two important numbers. The number of qubits, which I talked about before, and we've all got to over 115 qubits, and the number of gates. And so our goal over the next few years is to make a continuous path from error mitigation all the way out to error correction. To do this and to make it easy to use, quantum has to be performant and it has to be easy to use. And we're going to hear more about this today. But to go back, two years ago, we set a challenge that we wanted to achieve a milestone which we thought would be critical. We called it the 100 by 100 challenge. We promised that we would be able to extract accurate results from a quantum computer running circuits with 100 qubits and depths of 100. We also said we'd be able to do it in a day of runtime. And if you look at this another way, this is what we mean by 5,000 gates. And I'm happy to say we've reached the point where we can run 5,000 gates, and I'm going to turn it over to Abanov. Thanks, Jay. So I wanted to start with some context. How does one take a research demonstration and turn that into a service for our users to accelerate the pursuit of quantum advantage? A service capable of reliably executing utility scale circuits at the 5,000 2 qubit gate scale. Now, this was going to need tremendous progress in the scale quality and speed of our systems, but also reliability. Reliability of our hardware and software stack. So what we've done with our software is we've really driven the reliability of executing large utility scale workloads, but we've done this while simultaneously improving the speed of our circuit execution. We've now shown that experiments in the utility paper that took almost six days can now be executed in a little over two hours. That's a 50x speed up. That's 50x more experiments per unit time. Let's just think about the implications of that for accelerating the exploration of quantum advantage. And of course, simultaneously, we also had to improve the quality of our hardware. With our latest Heron processors, we've made a 5x improvement in median two qubit error rates over the 2023 utility experiment. And you'll hear more about this from Jerry. But the implications of these improvements for error mitigation sampling overheads are huge. I also told you about the importance of reliability. Two-level systems have been a big source of relaxation time fluctuations, and this impacts the stability, uniformity, and throughput of our quantum processors. This was increasingly a challenge as we want to execute utility-scale workloads with, with large qubit counts. In our latest Heron processors, We've now introduced capabilities to reduce the detrimental effect of these two-level systems. This can lead to a 30% improvement in median T1 times across the device, but even stabilize the noise for error mitigation. And even with these advances, there's still more room for improvement. And as we bleed in the improvements from our single qubit test devices into our larger processors, we're going to build an increasingly powerful computational tool. And here's the culmination of that effort. We now have a new computational tool for the reliable execution of utility scale circuits, right? circuits which are at a scale beyond brute force classical simulation. And to benchmark the performance of this tool at the 5K scale, we've employed mirrored extensions of the kicked icing utility circuits so that we know the answer even at this non-trivial scale. And this is the result. When we say 5K circuits, it doesn't mean that one can't execute circuits on our systems with larger gate counts. When we mean 5K, we mean we have an accuracy condition for the outputs of these circuits. Using methods in the utility paper, we're now able to achieve 
60% of weight one observables to be within a 10% error threshold at this 5K scale. But what I really want to emphasize is that these can now be run by you through our product stack. And this is just the start of our error mitigation roadmap. Further progress in speed, quality, and error mitigation methods will extend our reach to even more complex circuits and observables with better accuracy and faster runtime to solution. And already we're seeing evidence of this. With, with newer methods that will be introduced in the stack soon, we can achieve even more superior accuracies with you know, close to 90% of observables pa passing this 10% threshold at this 5K scale. With these advances, we've also extended the reach of methods like sample-based quantum diagonalization also to the 5K scale. You know, this, this extends previous research with Rekin at the 3.6K scale. These methods are also available in our Qiskit add-ons and are a powerful example of classical HPC and quantum joining forces. Here we benchmark the performance of these methods by estimating ground state energies for hydrogen chains. And we can see that you know, we're able to get results that, that, that outperform mean field solutions and with improvements in hardware are getting us closer to classical state of the art results. But when we announced the 100 by 100 challenge or the 5K challenge a couple of years ago, this was, this was never gonna be a journey for us alone. After all, realizing quantum advantage requires both high performance quantum computers, but also a community of developers like yourself creating algorithms that make use of them. So we're so excited to see our partners, Algorithmic and Kedma, also approach the 5K level on utility scale computations with their methods also accessible to users through Qiskit functions. And with that, we can check off the first box on our roadmap. Last year, we promised to deploy a 156 qubit Heron processor capable of accurately running circuits with at least 5,000 gates in 2024. And we've done that. <laughs> but we need more than just performant quantum computers. We also need performant tools to program those quantum computers. So now, I'd like to hand off to Heather, who will talk about how we're accelerating scientific discovery with high-performing quantum computing software. Thank you. Thanks, Avanov. I think it's apparent from our own results and from those of our partners that performant quantum computers are critical for accelerating scientific discovery. But as Avanov said, that's not the whole story. If we want to enable increasingly complex utility scale workloads, we also need performant software at all levels of our stack, from the QPU up to the user. Here's a diagram that shows how quantum needs to fit into a heterogeneous workflow as one of several different kinds of compute resources. Sitting on top of the quantum and classical computing environment is the Qiskit software ecosystem in that big purple box. But clearly there's more structure to this if you're a developer. You see there's an entire software stack within that box. That includes our heterogeneous orchestration layer, the development tools for writing and discovering algorithms, and an abstraction layer that helps you extend your applications. Every layer of this stack must be performant and intuitive. I'm gonna take the next few minutes to show you how we're improving performance across these different layers and how those improvements are helping developers to accelerate their research. Let's start with the Qiskit SDK. As you know, Qiskit is an open source SDK that enables users to run quantum circuits on over 10 different quantum hardware providers. And its popularity is evident. Over 74% of quantum programmers who responded to the 2024 Unitary Fund survey preferred Qiskit over any other quantum SDK. And it's built a strong ecosystem. Almost three quarters of its contributors are external to IBM. Qiskit has also been integrated into much of the quantum computing landscape. Nearly 5,200 projects that are dependent on the Qiskit SDK. So we want to make sure that it's the best SDK out there. This year, we've continued our focus on converting the code under the hood of Qiskit from Python to Rust to improve Qiskit's overall performance in terms of speed. Rust is a widely recognized as an efficient and performant language, and it's one of the fastest growing languages on GitHub. It offers key advantages in both memory safety and management, which can then translate into speed. 
With these updates, we've seen a more than 60x improvement in runtime over Qiskit 1.0, which we released in February this year. So we're confident that Qiskit is truly a performant SDK. But we can't say it's the most performant SDK unless we benchmark it against others. So earlier this year, we created BenchPress. BenchPress is a transparent, open source benchmarking tool based on industry standard tests. It benchmarks the ability of quantum SDKs to perform important tasks, like generating and transpiling circuits, both in terms of speed and in the quality of circuits as measured by the number of gates that they contain. This suite contains over 1,000 tests, which are mostly from third-party libraries. And we challenged a variety of other SDKs to see which came out on top. We're happy to say that based on this suite of tests, we found that the current version of Qiskit was 58 times faster at transpiling circuits than the second best competitor ticket. And it did so with 21% fewer two qubit gates in its output circuits. This means it creates more efficient circuits faster. Plus, not only was Qiskit faster and more effective at creating efficient circuits, but its functionality was also more comprehensive. Qiskit passed more of those 1,000 plus tests than any other SDK we tried. We think this makes Qiskit the clear choice for all quantum workloads that require speed, quality, and scale. But as I said before, Qiskit isn't the only dev tool in our software stack. We've also been working on improving the quantum computing stack performance using all available tools, including AI technologies. Using our Qiskit transpiler service, we're seeing an even larger improvement in circuit depth than with our open source SDK. With the help of AI-powered transpiler passes, Qiskit is able to run code more effectively to generate circuits with fewer gates, especially as the circuit sizes get larger where there's more room for optimization. In fact, if we look at 100 plus qubit circuits, we see an average of 36% improvement in the depth of output circuits over the open source SDK. And at even larger circuits, which are critical for running more complex algorithms, the results just get better. Looking at the largest circuits we tried, which were between 500 and 1,000 qubits, we're getting a 70% improvement in circuit depth over our open source SDK. That means I also get to check something off of our roadmap. The Qiskit transpiler service, which is available now to all of our premium users as a preview. <laughs> Finally, we're making improvements to our abstraction layer to provide more performant tools and make the quantum stack easier to use. Qiskit Serverless provides our interface to run workloads across those quantum and classical resources, and it now includes GPU support and increased CPU resources to both expand and improve the types of workloads that can be run on the system. We've also introduced a more flexible cloud object storage so that your data seamlessly persists across distributed workflows. I hope we've shown so far about how we're making quantum computers more performant with both our hardware and our software. But as we've said before, accelerating discovery needs more than speed. It also needs intuitive, easy to use software. I'd like to now introduce my colleague, Jen Glick, to discuss the tools that we've introduced to both enable new types of users and make quantum resources more approachable for scientific innovation. All right, thank you, Heather. So as you've heard, along with making our software more performant, we also are making it more intuitive and easy for you to use. Before we get into the specifics, I want to return to something that we introduced last year, which is the Qiskit Patterns Framework. We see quantum algorithms as sharing a common pattern. You start by mapping a problem to quantum, optimize it for the hardware, execute it using Qiskit runtime, and post-process those results. Now, all of this is just meant to serve as a starting point for thinking about how to build quantum workflows. It gives you context and intuition for what capabilities can fit into the various stages of the workflows that you're building. And the Qiskit SDK sets the foundation for building and running those quantum algorithms. It provides the core tools that we use, including some that you've just heard about, such as for transpilation and primitives. 
But to continue building and enabling algorithm design and discovery at scale, we need to add more capabilities on top of this foundation. So in other words, we're taking the utility scale research that we've been seeing and packaging it up into software tools that are easy for you to use. This means that you don't have to build from scratch and you can instead use these advanced capabilities out of the box in your own work. And this is why we launched Kiskit add-ons. Kiskit add-ons are a collection of research capabilities developed as modular power tools that can plug into a workflow to design new algorithms at the utility scale. Earlier this year, we introduced three add-ons, multi-product formulas, operator backpropagation, and sample-based quantum diagonalization. And now this week, we're releasing a fourth add-on called Approximate Quantum Compilation, or AQC Tensor. This is a tool that uses tensor networks to help map your problem directly down to lower depth circuits for execution on hardware. Now, we've designed all of these tools to be modular so that you can integrate them into your code without having to totally restructure your pipeline. These are power tools that make it easier to leverage advanced research out of the box without having to start from scratch. And what this means is that you can roll out new research faster. We're already seeing signs of this kind of acceleration in our work with our clients. So for example, over the course of a year, our team at IBM worked with Rekin to publish results showing that quantum-centric supercomputing architectures can use quantum data to adjust chemistry problems with large basis sets on our pre-fault tolerant devices. We took that research code, turned it into a tool called the SQD Kiskit add-on. And picking up this tool, teams at Cleveland Clinic, as well as Lockheed Martin, were able to see up to a 5x turnaround time on getting results for their own studies of chemical systems. We're very, very excited to see this kind of impact of Kiska add-ons continue extending out to the broader community. Now, we've talked a lot about various building blocks for doing research at utility scale. Next, what I want to talk about is the Kiskit functions catalog. This catalog is comprised of abstracted services that bring together a collection of building blocks and let you transform them into workflows to explore non-trivial experiments across a variety of different domains. These functions are provided by IBM and startups in our research ecosystem, and they come in two different flavors, application functions and circuit functions. So the first, application functions, allow the non-quantum researcher to experiment with quantum computing to solve their field's problems, all while using domain-familiar inputs and outputs. At IEEE this year, we launched the catalog with two application functions, and we're excited today to announce a third one by Multiverse Computing in the quantum machine learning and application space. The second type of function are called circuit functions. These are additional services that manage the optimization and execution of circuits for you. And these can be used to build up new future application functions. And all of these functions are provided through the Kiskit functions catalog. The catalog simplifies your experience when using them. Through the catalog interface, you can browse which functions are available to you, and you can load and remotely run those functions on tools that you're already familiar with, like Kiskit Serverless, Kiskit Runtime, and our fleet of QPUs. We're even making it easier to write Kiskit code from scratch. Last year, we showed off plans to release the Kiskit Code Assistant. The Code Assistant used generative AI powered by our open source IBM Granite model and Watson X. Now, there's multiple ways that you can use the Code Assistant. Here's one example where we use the Code Assistant to help us set up a VQE routine and leverage the session's execution mode that we introduced last year. The result is a program that more efficiently calculates the Hamiltonian's energy with the help of AI. And it's available today for our premium plan users. But writing code isn't the end of the road for AI assistance in quantum. We also know that migrating code to new versions is a pain point for users. Well, you can also use the Kiskit Code Assistant to help with your migration. And you can see that in action here. It can help you update your code and provide fixes. And finally, we recognize that running experiments at utility scale is hard. For example, you might not know when your experiment will return a signal until after you've run expensive circuits. It can also be challenging to figure out what type of error mitigation to use or how much to apply. 
And today, a lot of our users have tricks or techniques for working at utility scale and debugging their own experiments. So we are converting these techniques into easy to use software tools for you. You'll get to hear about the first of these on day three this week, a tool called Neat. It uses clipperization of your circuit and gives you a starting point to evaluate how the device noise might impact your experiment. And you can expect to see more tools like this one being rolled out next year. Now, I will get to check off a few things off the roadmap too. So first, let's check off the new Qiskit AI Code Assistant, which is available in preview. And second, here's something that I don't think we've ever done before. We can check off the Qiskit function service, which we'd originally slated for a 2025 release. Now I want to pause, uh, hand it back over to Jay for a quick recap before we dive into our latest innovations. <clears throat> Thanks, Jen. So I hope you see that Abanoff, Heather, and Jan have just showed you how we're improving the performance and, of our hardware and software to accelerate discovery. We showed that we could get Heron at 5K. We showed that we could get 150,000 clops for the performance of our hardware. We showed that focusing on the performance of Qiskit by Rust refactoring, we were able to improve it. We were able to get bench press and get benchmarking data to happen, launching the Qiskit transpiler service in preview and updates to Qiskit serverless. From the easy to use side, we've made add-ons and improvements to make it simpler to make modular code and to do research. We've created Qiskit Code Assist that can help you in migrating your code as well as simplifying how to program in the future. And as we go forward, new debugging tools are going to emerge to make it simpler to use. And lastly, Qiskit Functions is ahead of time, but I'm very excited to see how it goes and we showed that the first Qiskit Function catalog is out. So in short, we're offering the tools for scale, quality, and speed, so you can do the algorithm discovery that you need as we are accelerating this research and making quantum computing easier to use. But how does this all come together? Earlier, Heather showed you this stack view of our quantum computers plus Qiskit. You develop your code in Qiskit with the help of our developer tools like the SDK add-on and transpiler service. You put all this together and you can use things like Code Assist to simplify the coding and the functions offer some level of distraction. But all of this comes together in what we call the platform. This platform is our one-stop shop for doing useful work with quantum computers. Here's what you get when you log in. You can see the information about your plan, your usage, and the hardware you have available from IBM Quantum. And you can also notice the new Qiskit Functions tab where you can go and explore these functions. Along with this platform, We've equipped a learning application that offers you a variety of courses for everyone from beginners to experts. We're focused on making it easier to go from learning the foundations of quantum computing to building your own large scale circuits. We hope you enjoy these new learning paths that we've created. It includes experts such as John Watrous, and they're all free on the IBM Quantum Learning Platform. And we've already developed new courses to show you how you can start using these functions. So here's where we stand. From the development roadmap, we've checked off everything we've done. We've even checked off, as Jen said, Qiskit functions a little bit earlier than we planned. But the other part of our roadmap is to show you where we're going, show you the innovations we're doing, and I'd really like to hand it over to Jerry to talk you through the hardware innovations. Thanks, Jay. All right, so uh, to give, really give you the full story about the innovations, I actually want to start right back where we began, when uh, Abhinav actually told you a little bit about Heron. Now, if you remember, we made a really big deal about Heron last year, because it is a really big deal. But also, I think it needs to be repeated again, because we've actually brought in so much more. Now, the latest revision of Heron is the second one. We've actually managed to increase the number of qubits from 133 qubits to 156. We still preserve the heavy hex architecture, and we're using the tunable couplers, which allows us to suppress our crosstalk errors down to the 0.1% level. Now remember this, right? In stark contrast to the experience that we had, and certainly I think the users all had, with crosstalk that we would experience with Eagle. It's a big difference. But also now we've added in additional functionality 
to Heron, like Abhinav had mentioned, such as these integrated two-level system mitigation controls. In fact, hidden behind the covers, we've also made improvements to how we calibrate the tunable couplers underlying the, the gate architecture. It allows us to actually more optimally attain the performance of our two cubic gates given the coherence times that we have available to us. Back in August, we actually updated to Reno, our first Heron device, improving its median two cubic gate performance from 5e minus 3 to 3e minus 3. And now these new calibrations are actually typical across all of our new Heron deployments. And so here is our fleet of Herons. Three online right now, one just released right today, IBM Marrakesh, and a fourth one that's coming into our EU data center shortly. You can see that it's being actively calibrated right now. But also what you're starting to see now is that we're getting some of our best two cubic gates on superconducting qubits ever. Below the 1e minus 3 level, here on Marrakesh with a gate benchmarked to 7.5 times 10 to the minus 4. And then the TLS control knob is really another additional feature that we're so excited about and are actively exploring how best to use it for the performance of UR users. We've shown in some cases that we can actually use it to remove some of the low flyers in terms of coherence, where the qubits are directly impacted by these two level systems, we can recover its performance. Interestingly, for some of the error mitigation experiments, we can also use these same two level system controls to help stabilize the noise models for longer runs where we need that performance over a longer time for the error mitigation. And so I'm really proud to show this picture. It really shows how the Heron advantage is in full clear view. We've shown it in the past, right? We've shown the improvements and how the progress happened over time with Falcon and with Eagle for the cross resonance devices. But Heron is just another level of improvement. It lets us push down to the 1e minus 4 level, and that's going to power our extensions for the future part of our roadmap as we push out to deeper and more accurate circuits. Now, one last thing before I get to the shiny new objects. Uh, just last week, we also debuted these new fractional gates, fractional one and two cubic gates. Implementing gates with arbitrary angles previously actually required compiling down into multiple gates. But with fractional gates, now we can actually run this natively with just a single gate. So the benefits are really great. It's even greater for how we actually compile, compile down into two qubit fractional gate space. In addition, we also wanted to bring a better experience for, uh, to our users with dynamic circuits. So as we make modifications in the future, we're going to be allowing for better efficient parallel execution of conditional blocks. That's coming early next year. And that's gonna come in line with a lot of the runtime improvements that you heard from Abhinav earlier, which all will translate towards faster and better performance for dynamic circuits as well, broadening the scope of circuits that you all have available to you to use. Okay, so now let's talk about what's new. Last year we told you that we'd start developing new couplers that actually run gates across multiple chips. Now I'm excited to report on those innovations. Here you can see Flamingo connects two Heron chips with four connectors measuring up to a meter long. We've demonstrated the technology for a high quality cable, but maybe what's more important is that we've shown ability to actually have a pluggable and repluggable connector to bridge across these devices and to really take this outside of just a research demonstration, but towards a more confident deployable technology later next year. The L couplers allow us to have modular system design to avoid wiring limitations and it lets us better use the space within cryogenic infrastructure. And I'm excited to say we're right in the middle of testing this technology with connecting across two Heron chips. We've benchmarked a distance C0 gate between data qubits connected by an L coupler with 96.5% fidelity on a test device in a loopback configuration. But now we've integrated that technology with Flamingo and I've already started to demonstrate transfer of excitation between qubits back and forth on separate Flamingo payloads connected by about a meter long cable. So all this gives us the confidence and learning to really promote this up towards deployment late next year. So now I get to check some things off the roadmap too. First, 
Let's check off the demonstration of L-couplers. So L-couplers were one way, right, that we showed how we we're gonna continue the scale modularly. But looking back last year, right, we introduced to you uh, Condor. Condor was an experiment for us in scaling and yield, but it happened in a monolithic sense. It had 1,121 qubits, the chip was about the size of a business card, and the package was actually about the size of a coffee table book. It certainly pushed the limits of what we could scale, but we also know that this type of monolithic scaling has an ultimate limit. And so that's why we're also introducing our latest innovations with M-couplers in Crossbill. Now, M-couplers are interconnects between chips. In this case, actually across three by 160 qubit chips connected into a single package for a total of 480 qubits. You add in all the tunable couplers of this architecture, means we actually have over 1,000 total quantum elements, which is the same complexity as Condor, but built in this modular fashion. We're excited about the technologies that are in Crossbill including 99% two qubit gates that have been demonstrated across chips in prior test devices. And we really love showing real things, and so Jay's going to bring out this full-size wafer. Flip it around, it's upside down. <laughs> uh, now, so this is actually the interposer for Crossbill. You can see exactly one of the interposers on this full wafer on which we would place three chips. But I think more importantly, I'm excited to say that we're now leveraging the most state-of-the-art semiconductor technology to fabricate this type of large-scale, high-density silicon package. And this lets us actually integrate the connector technology directly onto Crossville. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. Now this type of technology development is a really big deal because it lets us leverage this type of fabrication methods to really scale modularly. And in fact, it gives us new scaling options for the next parts of our roadmap. Here you can see side by side with the integrated connectors how much smaller the package for Crossbill is compared to Condor. So I'm excited to say with all the prototype innovations demonstrated, we're entering assembly of Crossbill for the next phase of testing. And so with that, I'd like to tick off M-coupler technology innovation for our roadmap. Now, earlier this year, we made the cover of Nature, right, by demonstrating a new kind of error correcting code, which we previewed last year in our State of the Union. This code reduced the number of qubits required for error correction by 90% versus, say, the surface code, but it requires a lot of new detailed hardware innovation. First, it requires our qubits to have higher connectivity than any previous IBM quantum chip. So this year, we actually demonstrated six-way couplers. Now we can actually begin to connect a qubit to twice as many qubits without loss of gate fidelity and without errors from neighboring spectator qubits. We're gonna combine this with continued improvements to T1 and T2 to really achieve the error rate thresholds that are gonna be needed by our quantum LDPC error correcting codes. The other advancement that we need are C couplers. Because of the type of connectivity required by the LDPC codes, we need connectors that go outside of the plane in order to create more complex qubit graphs. We're getting there with these low loss buried interconnect technologies. So we're expanding the full packaging technology that we've shown previously to have the ability to connect these C couplers. And these technologies, I'm excited to say, will be coming to life into Kookaburra for demonstrating error correction. Now, of course, we're obviously not just stopping there, and we are already thinking all the way out in our roadmap to Starling. We'll all need to be able to control the qubits at an even higher scale then, and with low gate errors, but also, critically, at a low cost. And so we're excited to show off a new CMOS control that actually lives inside the dilution refrigerator. These are actual chips in the fridge controlling actual two qubit tunable coupler gates down to the 1E minus three level. And in fact, we are able to scale out a single chip out to a parallel set of 16 control lines. 
I hope I've gotten you excited about all that's to come. And I'm going to now hand it off to Iskander, who will talk through the final major advance promised by our innovation roadmap, a true realization of a quantum-centric supercomputing. So today, classical computational facilities are capable of running tremendously complex workloads. And the systems that are in charge of those capabilities are called workload management systems. They oversee available computational resources and efficiently execute tasks on them. This year, we're bringing quantum into the picture of workload management. And we're working to make quantum the first class citizen in any high performance computing environment. And we're doing so by developing system architectures that are easy to integrate into existing high performance computing ecosystem, has tighter resource coupling, which opens up possibility to run high throughput parallel workloads, has high resource utilization by separating compute into classical, typed quantum, and the hybrid models. But integrating new resource into compute infrastructure means we have to expose resource control capabilities. And we are doing so in two ways. First, what we call quantum cloud bursting, where workload management system offloads quantum tasks to IBM quantum platform via channels API. And a second, we would like to introduce a new lower level quantum system control API we call direct access. This enables you to control system state directly and leverage in-system parallelism to drive performance. But let's give it a demonstration. We've been working with our partners at RPI to realize first quantum-centric supercomputing facility within the walls of university. We are connecting AMOS supercomputer and quantum system one into singular computational environment managed by Slurm resource manager. Of course, we're not forgetting about user experience as well. Since Qiskit is de facto standard tool for any quantum computational scientist, therefore we developed provider to execute Qiskit primitives using workload management system. But running Qiskit primitives is part of bigger algorithmic workflow. And naturally, for the first demonstration, we pick SQD algorithm that we showed earlier. We wrote mapping, circuit optimization, execution, and post-processing as a tasks of a workflow, and execute them all in an all-native to HPC fashion. So this demonstration is the first time we're showing heterogeneous, truly heterogeneous workflow in a fully realized quantum-centric supercomputing environment. At IBM, we're saying that the future of computing is bit, neuron, and qubit. And this future starts now. <laughs> that means I get to check the final check mark of the day with the resource management. <laughs> and now I'm going to hand it back to Jay to finish things off. Thanks, Iskander. Thanks, Jerry. I really hope you see that we are both working towards our development roadmap and our innovation roadmap to bring both our fault-tolerant quantum computer to reality, as well as set the foundations for getting to quantum advantage. And now this is where you come in. Because accelerating discovery and discovering new algorithms, as I said at the start, is not something IBM can do alone. Solving these big problems requires a dedicated community of industry, researchers, and users committed to the discovery of algorithms together. This means smart professors, smart industry experts, and of course, it means smart students. It is all of you who are the experts in your respective fields, like chemistry, material science, optimization, finance, and much, much more, that are the ones that are going to discover these algorithms that lead to the first quantum advantage. Our network is growing every day. I am so excited to welcome our new quantum innovation centers, industry clients, academic members, and ecosystem partners from around the world. Together with the rest of the network, you have access to the largest fleet of quantum computers in the world. And not only are we providing these high performance services and easy to use tools, we're also collaborating to accelerate the development of use cases with quantum computing. Together with the community, we've organized these five working groups. 
These groups are exploring applications in optimization, material science, high energy physics, healthcare and life science, and sustainability. And we offer access to these services through these four access plans, which now we offer access to these services through our four access plans. And we have now allowed users to leverage third-party licenses by the IBM Quantum Platform through the Qiskit Functions Catalog. And while we're making our products performant and easy to use, we hope you've noticed these improvements in the services too. You can now use your capacity more efficient than ever before by running these utility scale workloads 50 times faster. This means you can do more work for the same cost. And now I wanna bring it back to where we started. I hope you, we've shown you that quantum has reached a point where it can be used as a tool for scientific discovery. Let's unlock quantum advantage together and bring useful quantum computing to the world. And it is us all doing this discovery together. And that's why we're gathered here today.